Perfect. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Sens, and I serve as the Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. On behalf of the school and on behalf of the Earth Commons, I'm delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's event, one which we've been anticipating with excitement for some time. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from, converse with, and celebrate a scholar and activist whose work has led to the creation of an entire field of academic study and whose rigorous sociological scholarship and dynamic advocacy have, among other things, brought about crucial and deeply significant changes to policy and to law. Dr. Robert Bullard, the father of environmental justice. This is a celebration deferred. The Graduate School had hoped to honor Dr. Bullard in person at last year's commencement exercises, but he was prevented from traveling and could not attend the ceremony. His commencement address was read at the ceremony with great aplomb by his good friend, Dr. Sheila Foster, Scott K. Ginsburg Professor of Urban Law and Policy and Professor of Public Policy. And we awarded Dr. Bullard a Doctorate of, Honor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, in absentia. It is thus with great pleasure that we welcome Dr. Bullard to the hilltop. Following Dr. Bullard's lecture, Dr. Foster will join him on stage for a conversation. And then there will be an opportunity for questions and discussions from the floor. But first, it is my distinct honor and privilege to be able to invite to the microphone Georgetown's president, John J. DeJoya, who will introduce Dr. Bullard more formally. Dr. DeJoya. Thank you very much, Dean Sens, and good afternoon, everyone. It is a joy to be with all of you as we welcome Dr. Robert Bullard to Georgetown, as, as Dean Sens has shared. This is a much anticipated gathering for us. Dr. Bullard was our commencement speaker and a recipient of an honorary degree at our graduate school commencement last spring. And while we were still able to hear his address, we greatly missed his presence and we're deeply honored by the opportunity to welcome him now to our campus. I'd also like to express my gratitude to Professor Sheila Foster for her efforts at our commencement last year and for moderating our conversation this afternoon. In recent years, our community has been increasingly engaged in addressing issues of environmental conservation and justice. Our Earth Commons, which we established in 2022 under the leadership of Dr. Pete Mara, provides a home on our campus for our faculty, staff, and students to study, engage, and protect our environment. Working with the Graduate School, the Earth Commons has launched a new master's degree in environmental and sustainability management. It supports interdisciplinary research and advocacy and works closely with colleagues around the university to host events and convenings like the one we are gathered here this afternoon. We could not be more honored to have Dr. Bullard here with us. Over the course of his career, he has transformed how we understand the intersection of racial equity, justice, and the environment. Recognized as the father of environmental justice, he has tied his scholarship and his academic insights to advocacy and change, helping to illuminate injustices and point to solutions that can serve all of our communities, advance equity, advance justice, and protect our planet. Dr. Bullard began his work when lawyer Linda McKeever, his wife, filed a class action lawsuit in 1979 against a waste disposal company attempting to place a municipal landfill in middle-class black neighborhood in Houston, Texas. His report as an expert witness was one of the first comprehensive accounts of environmental racism in the United States. It revealed that for almost 50 years, between the 1930s and 1978, the city of Houston had disposed 82% of its solid waste in Black communities, 
a disproportionate amount given that only 25% of the city's residents were black. This eight year lawsuit, Bean versus Southwestern Waste Management, helped to inaugurate the environmental justice movement. Dr. Bullard expanded his study across the Southern United States, which formed the basis of his first book, Dumping in Dixie, Race, Class, and Environmental Quality. It was published in 1989 and described systemic exposure to pollution in black communities. Dumping in Dixie is now a standard text in the environmental justice field with over 5,600 scholarly citations. Since then, Dr. Bullard has authored or co-authored over 70 articles in 18 books, including The Wrong Complexion for Protection and Confronting Environmental Racism Voices from the Grassroots. Both address issues that range from sustainable development and regional equity to environmental racism and community resilience. In recognition of his work, President Biden named Dr. Bullard to the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council in 2021. At the council, he led efforts that contributed to the allocation of $60 billion toward environmental protection for at-risk communities as part of the larger $370 billion Build Back Better spending bill. That same year, he was appointed founding director of Texas Southern University's newly launched Bullard Center for Environmental and Climate Justice with support from the Houston Endowment and the Bezos Earth Fund. In the reflections that he prepared for our graduate school commencement last May, Dr. Bullard spoke about the work of environmental justice. And I'll quote, in 1979, environmental justice was a footnote. Today, it's a headline. After 42 years, it looks like the arc of the moral universe is beginning to bend toward environmental justice. But this quest for justice is a marathon relay. I encourage each of you to run your 26.2 miles and pass the baton to the next runner to run the next 26.2 mile leg. Keep in mind, long distance runners for justice must have the stamina, endurance, and focus to stay the course, close quote. There's perhaps no better description of the leadership that Dr. Bullard has provided us than his words, reminding each of us of our commitment to the common good and the steadfast pursuit of justice. We're deeply grateful for the contributions he has made, the impact that he has had on communities around our nation, and the urgency that he brings to the movement for environmental justice. So Dr. Bullard, we are so grateful for this opportunity to express in person our appreciation for your leadership and to have the opportunity to recognize you with an honorary degree last spring. It is a privilege to have you here with us today. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Bullard to the podium to offer some reflections. Dr. Bullard. Thank you very much, President Adoya, administration, faculty, students. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure to be here in person. Uh, I am a real person. Um, the, the quest for environmental justice and the this whole idea of how do we get to justice and why it's so important and the urgency of now. So reflecting on uh, some 44 years working in this area, uh, environmental justice in the US from a footnote to a headline. And my job is to connect dots. I was very good at it as a kid with the game, connect the dots. I'm very good at it today. Our movement has redefined environmentalism. 
and the environment. The environment is everything. It's where we live, work, play, worship, go to school, as well as the physical and natural world. That doesn't leave a whole lot out. Environmental justice embraces the principle that all people, communities, are entitled to equal protection of our environmental energy, health, employment, education, housing, transportation, and civil rights laws. It doesn't leave a whole lot out. So when we talk about environmental justice, we're talking about basic human rights and the right to breathe clean air, clean water, and to have our kids go outside and play on the playgrounds without the swings and the jungle gyms not being across from a refinery or landfill or a highway, freeway. We are serious about this. This was not new. 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King went to Memphis, Tennessee on an environmental economic justice mission, striking garbage workers. Memphis was his last crusade. The garbage piled up and they had to call out the National Guard. The garbage was a justice issue then. It's a justice issue decades later. And as the president mentioned, dumping garbage on black people was not natural. And the assault on environmental racism was about civil rights. Being versus, being versus Southwest and Wage Management Corporation was a fight for basic civil rights of having garbage being dumped on a black middle-class suburban neighborhood where nothing was out there in Northeast Houston except trees, houses, and black people. Houston is the only major city in the country that doesn't have zoning, didn't have zoning then, but what it had is unofficial zoning. You know, you've heard of NIMBY, not in my backyard. What they had in Houston was called PIBI, Place in Black's Backyard. The lawsuit was, was, was um, innovative and creative. Linda developed the legal theory as a lawyer, and my job as a sociologist was to develop the research protocol and the methodology for designing a study that could show discrimination citing. This is before, this is 1979. There was no Google, there was no GIS, there was no iPhone, iPad, none of that. This is research ancient with a hammer and a chisel, microfiche going to the library, card catalog, running data on punch cards. I know you don't know what I'm talking about. This is all in the museum now. That was research. I tell people I am a sociologist. But I do not do dead white man sociology. I do what's called scientifically called kick-ass sociology. So, so the Bean case and the research that we did uh, was groundbreaking. And we didn't know it at the time. The lawsuit, as the stats show, we were able to publish articles in referee journals. I was able to write, publish, get it written up. But we lost the lawsuit, even though the, the numbers are staggering in terms of not being random, but it's hard, it was harder to get a published article in a scientific journal than it was to win in court in 1979, 1985. So having the data is not enough. It's never been enough. You must marry the data with facts. The name of the landfill is Whispering Pines, sanitary landfill. So, Whispering so Pines sounds like a Subdivision, I would love to live in Whispering Pines. No, it's a garbage dump. You dress it up, it's still a dump. Second largest waste disposal company in the world, won't call it initials, but at the time it was BFI, locating landfills in the community. 1982 was the year that the movement was actually born. Pre-1982, there was no movement. There had to be one particular incident, North Carolina, Again, about waste, in this case, toxic waste. These are kids in Warren County putting their bodies. These are middle school kids, not old enough to vote, but they knew that dumping poison on black people in Warren County was wrong. And Dr. Benjamin Chavis, who led the struggle in North Carolina that gave birth to a larger movement, social justice, said this is environmental racism. The 1990s, HBCUs blazed the trail for doing the research and developing the foundation uh, for environmental justice. It is no accident that the first five environmental centers, ju environmental justice centers 
in the whole United States at universities. All five of them were located at HBCUs. Xavier University in, New, in uh, New Orleans, Black Atlanta University, my alma mater in Atlanta, Hampton University, Florida Andean University, and Texas Southern University. We did most of the research. Dumping and Dixie was the first book on environmental justice, environmental racism. I, I finished that book in 1989. It took a long time to get it published because I was getting nasty notes back saying, oh, there's no such thing as environmental racism. The environment is neutral. Everybody's treated the same. And it took me a year to get it published. And Westview Press in Boulder, Colorado. I don't know if you know Boulder. If you're from Boulder, you know what Boulder, been to Boulder, Boulder, but Boulder is different. Westview Press is, is based in Boulder. Mountain High Air, Bean Sprouts, Tofu, Marijuana. They said, I'm going to publish the book. And they published it. So, so, so the idea, when I left Houston in 1987, I had one book, Invisible Houston. I came back to Houston after going to California, teaching at the University of California, and then moving to Atlanta, and then moving back to Houston. I had one book in 1987, Invisible Houston. When I came back in 2011, Houston, where I am now, to the same university, I had written 17 books. I don't know how that happened, but I like writing. I like documenting. But having those books, having those facts has never been enough. We have to marry the facts with action. Dumping in Dixie, unequal protection, just transportation, sprawl city, highway robbery. I was telling students this morning, I wrote a book on highway robbery and another, another book on just transportation. It's about how transportation can give you opportunity, access to jobs, et cetera, but it can also destroy your communities when highways run through, rip through, destroy. Health, sprawl, regional equity, wrong complexion for protection. I mean, these are books that I, that I wrote that I gained insight from communities that were struggling all across the United States. And race matters. Uh, race is the most potent factor and predictor as to who's getting dumped on and who doesn't get responded to. Environmental threats track closely with historic redlining. Redline neighborhoods are more likely to be waste dumping grounds, environmental sacrifice zones, nature deprived areas, they're more likely to be urban heat islands and, and, and hot spots for flooding, food deserts, energy insecurity, hot spots, and most likely to get left out of disaster funding from FEMA. I'm gonna run through this real quick and show you that we have the facts, we have the science, and now we have resources from the federal government, thanks to the Biden administration, to tackle these problems that have lingered for far too long. The Raw Complexion for Protection is a book that we wrote that looked at eight decades of government responding to disasters, floods, hurricanes, uh, destructions in terms of crop damages, went from 19, the, 19, the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 all the way up to the BP spill, including Katrina. And what we found on 300 pages is that the government has not responded equally to all communities, that it has been biased in the response. When we talk about climate change, Climate change is the number one environmental threat to humanity. You can run, but you can't hide. It's impact in the whole planet. But some communities are impacted greater than others. Climate change hits people of color hardest in the U.S. as well as around the world. This is a 2021 study by EPA that showed that and documented that. Climate change will lead to more bad air days. Right now in the U.S., people of color are more likely to be, live in areas that are called non-attainment. We're more likely to also uh, live in neighborhoods that have been redlined where pollution is more. Well, if you, if you are dumped on in terms of industrial facilities and power plants and all this, it is not rocket science as to why you get more polluted. If you talk about people of color face more pollution from more sources, we have the landfill, the incinerator, the highway, we have all these other different railroad tracks, uh, 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 yards, uh, railroad tracks, switching yards. You start naming all this stuff, and it's like, how is it that fine our communities? People of color also breathe other people's pollution. If you look at per capita income, rich people produce more pollution per capita than poor people, their lifestyles. And as a matter of fact, when you talk about this transfer of, of harm and the cost, 
That is environmental justice. When we talk about segregated neighborhoods, are more likely residents are more likely to breathe bad air. Uh, and in some cases, is three times worse than than the air that 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 whites breathe. breathe. In other cases, if you talk about metals, it's ten times. So you look at the health disparities. If you talk about historic red liners of of oil and gas facilities, I live in Texas, Houston, or Petropolis. But if you look at who lives closest to these facilities, it's people of color. We live across the fence. We could walk to work, but the jobs are not for us. Environmental justice impact of flaring, of gas leaks. We got more facilities in our community, so we get more leaks, more accidents. It ends up creating more health disparities. If you look at asthma rates of, among uh, Black and Hispanic children, it's four times more likely to be sent to the hospital if you are a child of color. And for African-American children, the asthma death rate is not four times, it's eight times. That is unacceptable. If we talk about climate change will make for hotter days, hotter days mean warmer days. We talk about really hot in the summertime. You see the map, the, dark, the darker the red, the more the increases. When we talk about redlining has left neighborhoods hot because no trees, no green canopy, uh, no, no, no parks. It means that it could be, if you're in a neighborhood where there's trees and it's 90, and it's 90 degrees in the shade, it could be 110, 115 if you live in a neighborhood that's been redlined. Racism in planning, in my profession, my department, the field has contributed to it. Plan it. That's why we say we can't just leave planning just to planners. Heat stress, when it gets hot, more people of color are sent to the hospital in the emergency room because of economics and because of the physical location of where we live. Heat and pollution combines for bad pregnancy outcome, disproportionately impacting women of color. When it gets too hot to work outside, workers of color are more likely to be impacted because those are the jobs that we have. When we talk about threats from flooding, neighborhoods that have been redlined are more likely to flood. Going into the future, we're talking about racism in the past, meaning that we create vulnerability going forward. Neighborhoods and communities that have a high percentage of people of color are more likely to suffer more flooding when we talk about 20 years, 30 years from now. When we talk about Harvey, I had to be evacuated but from Harvey in Houston in 2017. But when you look at the neighborhoods that, were, that got the worst flooding, black and brown. But if you look at the neighborhoods that got the most recovery dollars, not our communities. When we talk about flood insurance is increasing, look at the states that's got, it's gonna have the greatest increase in flooding. Gulf Coast states. If you talk about beyond, if moving beyond fossil fuels, Bloomberg has a program now, $85 million to move us away from fossil fuels. And again, our center is part of that program. If you look at the hotspots, Texas, Louisiana, and Ohio Valley, hotspots for pollution, refineries, petrochemicals. So we have to move away. Our communities are most vulnerable. We live across the fence from refineries. This is not trick photography. I took this photo. If we talk about this is Cesar Chavez High School in Houston, you don't have to be a PhD to understand who goes to Cesar Chavez High School. Look at the name. It's across the fence, black and brown. When we talk about our neighborhoods are on the tree line with these refineries. And so when we talk about where is the geography of refineries, look at the dots. You can see in terms of who lives closest to these facilities and who's most in peril in terms of cancer rates, half of the people that are at risk from oil refinery um, ca cancer health threats are people of color. If you look at the dirtiest uh, refineries releasing benzene, we call this the dirty dozen plus one. These are the 13 refineries in the country that's reducing, that's, re that's uh, releasing dangerous benzene and benzene is not health enhancing, causes cancer. If you talk about segregated housing and more pollution, same kind of thing. If you talk about same kind of thing, Oh, I'm repeating myself. Okay, here's a project. We're doing a study right now looking at where are the export terminals, the LNG export terminals. Well, we, do, we, we got money to do a study, but we, we know what we're going to find. Look at, the, look at the clustering of export terminal. LNG. LNG is what is it? Methane. So, so when we talk about the clustering of these facilities, and just last week, uh, FERC, uh, approved two new facilities. What do you think they are? In Texas, where do you think they are? 
same pattern. So when we talk about who gets federal disaster funding and who gets left behind, we're talking about FEMA, race, climate change will increase this wealth gap and income gap. And if the money is not spent equitably, the money, the recovery dollars will increase that gap. Here's a study that's done by Rice and Pitt uh, showed that when $10 billion severe weather events hit, uh, white communities end up, at the money comes in, $126,000 better off. People of color, on average, lose wealth, $29,000, losing wealth. The community that started off with lower wealth end up losing wealth, getting further and further behind. FEMA's own study showed that their recovery dollars is not reaching those most in need because they're using cost-benefit analysis. If you just use cost-benefit analysis to talk about where money is flowing, we know, and I had a formula, very scientific, money follows money, money follows power, money follows whites. FEMA's own study showing this is what's here occurring. If you just use cost-benefit analysis, the money will always go to the $800,000 homes on the west side versus the $80,000 homes on the, on the east side. And so the money, as it gets distributed, you need another formula. We need to use the social vulnerability index that was developed by CDC and the environmental justice index that was developed by the CDC that builds in all those other social determinants. If you talk about managed retreat, that's nothing more than a, say, a way of saying, well, we need to get people out of harm's way. Managed retreat ends up getting middle income folks out of harm's way. Poor people are left behind with flooding and, and deserted. Buyouts favor uh, 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 people, of, people who have more money. And, and so we talk about Justice 40. Justice 40 is an initiative that the President of the United States, Biden, in Harris has come up with to say, as we transition to a clean energy economy, we should not, cannot, and must not follow that same pattern that developed under that old oil and gas petrochemical, that, that we have the refineries and the, and the oil and gas facilities across the fence. We don't, get the, we don't even get the jobs. We get polluted, we get sick, and we get sent to the cemetery. The Justice 40 initiative is to correct that. 40% of the benefits that would accrue to move into a clean energy economy is to go to those disadvantaged communities, those forgotten communities, those communities that have not been part of, of uh, the economy and part of, of uh, this economic renaissance. In 2000, uh, well, Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act and they put, they put 370, uh, 369, rounded off, $70 billion, billion here, billion there, for climate change. Now, $60 billion for environmental justice. We've never had that kind of money with a B. And $60 billion with a B for, for clean energy transition. So you put those two together, that's $120 billion to work on correcting uh, the, some of the challenges that you saw on those maps. And so the challenge is, 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 is making sure that resources follow need. Not that historical pattern of if you have the power, you have the lawyers, and you have the scientists, and you have the other folks, the politicians on your side, you get the money, you get the shovel-ready projects that, were, that didn't have any community input that was not democratic. And so last Thursday, I think it was Thursday, President Biden invited a few of us to the, uh, to the White House. Now, I went to the White House for the first signing of the executive order, 1994. February on the Bill Clinton and Al Gore. And we went to the Oval Office and they signed it on the dot. They gave us pens. We didn't get pens this time. But it was a bunch of people out there. It was a lot of people, grassroots folks. And they signed, he signed the executive order, put his pen to paper to say, this executive order does, it goes much further than 1994 because there's been a lot of change in the 25 years. Do you hear what I'm saying? 1994. 1994 was a long time ago when it comes to environmental justice. Today, you are alive, and the fact that we can do a lot when it comes to environmental justice. And I was standing behind the president, and it was exciting. And when he, after he signed it, um, then everybody was chap clapping and cheering. I'm like, oh, right, all right, go, let's go do it. That was my expression. It wasn't disrespect anything. The idea... The idea that we have an opportunity now. I tell people I'm a boomer, proud of it, still standing. Marine, Vietnam, 
Marine Corps vet, Marine Corps, Vietnam era Marine Corps vet, Ura, still fighting. But millennials, Zoomers, and younger, you are not my generation. You are the majority. And, and many of you are coming into your own together. Millennials, Gen Xers, Zoomers, and beyond, working with boomers, intergenerational, we can change this country and we can change the world. I believe that. So we are talking about this marathon relay. That president said, you know, that we know, you know, I, you, when I was in high school, I ran track. We know there's no such, you know, track and field race, marathon relay. But the, the race for justice is a marathon relay. I have students who have students who have students who do this work now, which means you pass it on, you pass it forward. You run your 26.2 miles. You know, I got corrected. You know, um, Al Gore was a marathoner. And I used to say, if you run your 26 miles, he said, Dr. Bullard, Dr. Bullard, he said, no, it's 26.2. He said, because that point two is the hardest. Well, you pass that baton and you mentor, you work with young people and you hope you have, you make a smooth transition, that handoff, because if you drop the baton, that's, that's a setback. We don't need any setbacks. We need smooth transition. And we need to see young people who are committed to justice. I believe that we will get this right with this new majority and with the urgency of now. We can't wait 44 years to get this right. We don't have that time. The clock is ticking. And the urgency of now is right now. And I think that. When we come together across the different disciplines, I can remember before when they wouldn't let a sociologist in the room with climate scientists talking about these issues. And they were smart people, but they don't know every damn thing. And our position is climate change is more than parts per million in greenhouse gases. It's also about responsibility and vulnerability. At COP27, that was in Sharm el in Egypt this past November, for the first time, I thought I had a photo in there, the, there was a climate justice pavilion at that COP meeting, the blue zone where the government decisions are being made about climate. The first time at the 27 COPs, this is the first time, and it took three organizations, the Bullet Center at, at, at Texas Southern University, Deep South Center uh, in New Orleans, and we act for justice in Harlem, New York. Our three organizations came together and raised the money to have a climate justice pavilion on the blue zone for the world to come and interact and present. First time. That, that pavilion was a magnet for climate justice and environmental justice and energy justice around the world. We coming together globally we were able to get governments, including our own, to adopt and to agree that loss and damage, a form of reparation, climate finance reform, to be top, front and center. And for 27 or 26 cops before, our government and government and, and governments from industrial countries had resisted because when you own it, you have to pay. And there's a principle called polluter pay principle. Those who have contributed the most must step up and address these issues. Those who have contributed least but feeling the pain, the hurt, first, worst, and longest need to somehow have be supported because they are go going under right now, sinking and having droughts and having dangerous storms destroyed. So our movement that emerged out of Houston and North Carolina and across the country has been global lies to the point where environmental and climate justice is, not, is no longer a footnote, it is a headline. We must keep it a headline and we must keep the pressure to ensure that resources flow to need and that our elected officials 
represent us. And if they're not, uh, there's a way that we can respond to that. And I think we have to make sure that our voting is about environmental justice. When, they, when, when people in power, elected officials, politicians suppress vote and take away your democratic rights, that means you don't have a voice in those rooms. So we have to fight for justice as it relates to environmental, climate, energy, economic health, but we also have to fight, fight for justice in the political arena when it comes to protecting our democracy. It's all connected. And we must make sure that we never turn away when it comes to democratic principles and environmental justice principles that people most impacted must speak for themselves and must be in those rooms when decisions are being made about their future. That's what environmental justice is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bullard. You are a legend, first of all. Um, and thank you for coming to Georgetown and for um, doing what you do, which is to inspire the next generation. Um, let me start with this. Talking about this moment in the environmental justice movement, 42 years after you got into it, 20 some years after the first executive order, we've been through many administrations. We've been through the Obama administration. We've been through, um, you know, attempts at the EPA to do more on environmental justice, a civil rights, um, um, a lot of civil rights cases that have been brought in, in court. But this moment, you seem to suggest is different, is transformative. Can you just say a little bit more about what it is about this moment? I think this moment is different in that we have the potential for um, transforming uh, the way that we see the environment, our movement, the issues of health, human rights, and how we connect those dots. And I think the, the for example, the executive order that the president signed uh, is significant in that, that he's talking about a whole of government and having environmental justice embedded across the various um, departments. I mean, even, in, for example, the Justice Department now has an Office of Civil Rights and Environmental Justice, and they are like a strike team. They, they went to, they went to um, Alabama, Lowndes County, Alabama, because of lack of water infrastructure. They investigated the state of Alabama. They came to Houston in terms of waste and garbage. They came, they're coming after uh, states that are not, and cities that are not doing what they're supposed to do, they're not timid and shy. The fact that we have the Inflation Reduction Act and there's resources now available to implement a lot of the things mm. that we wanted to get enacted in the 94 executive order, but there was no money. But now there's money, there's resources. The, not that we can get personnel, get action. The fact that that, that we have Today, uh, intergenerational mobilization. We had that in the past, but now young people, you know, with the, the aw uh, awakening in 2021, 20, with George Floyd and, and, and the awakening of, of uh, climate urgency, we have a lot of opportunities now uh, to track the solutions in a way that are not seen as outliers, as outside of the box. And it's important for us to uh, stay focused and to, and to really, whenever we can, to allow those voices or facilitate those voices on the front line and on the fence line, to be in those rooms, to challenge. We have training now that we have been, been able to get uh, uh, communities and, and, and community-based organizations and leaders, uh, the expertise and the skills to go in those rooms with data, with facts, with science, 
Then we have, you know, uh, citizen, well, no, don't use this, community science. Uh, we have um, research to acid, community based participatory research. This stuff now is mainstream and there's money in place to get it done. And so that's the kind of work um, that gives me, you know, hope that we're going to have to press it. We're going to move fast and furious on it. And I think the, the fact that a lot of the, the information now has been translated language wise and understanding wise communicates. We have uh, rapid deployment teams, like on our project with, with our Justice 40. When communities call us, we, we have teams of experts that are on call that we can point to and say, we need to go somewhere, wherever that way is, to work on these issues. And we don't have to get them at pro bono. We have a little money to, you know what I'm saying, compensate. That's the kind of difference now, as opposed to years later. And then finally, I think it's important to get the federal government recognized. There's some things that the federal government can do and should be doing where it's not being done at the state level. And that where the state is not doing its job uh, in terms of, of uh, laws and regulation that have been delegated to the state, the federal government can step in and when possible, uh, use its uh, discretion to pull the money. They've never done that before. We're waiting and we're pressing because we got some good case studies, textbooks cases where the states are not doing what they're supposed to do and that money needs to be pulled and, and, and pulled immediately. The other thing that strikes me about this moment and your slides really drove it home to me, a lot of the science about the impacts that communities of color are still in poor communities are still suffering from is new. A lot of those studies were 2020, 2021, 2022. That suggests to me that despite the celebratory moment we're in about how much Biden has done, how much money is flowing, that this stuff is so baked in to the way in which our economy functions, um, that it's very hard to say. And you know, when I first got into this, Bob, reading your work in 19, right in the 1990s, I thought it was a revelation that there were actually statistics that showed this stuff. I was like, wow. I mean, I thought I was gonna be a civil rights lawyer and that totally changed the path of my career to become an environmental justice lawyer. But now I see these studies and I'm depressed because it's like, is it ever gonna change? I mean, what you, that's devastating, those pictures. So what is your, uh, I mean, do you still, are you still hopeful that we can change how baked in redlining is and racial zoning and all the stuff in the past that has made communities vulnerable first to hazards, now to climate? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I am I'm a realist and I understand, I, I like maps, and those maps should make us angry and force us to act with urgency. You know, I got a map. If we look at the 1820 map, 1820 map, not 1820 map of the Missouri Compromise, when Black people were, uh, for the sake of representation, in terms of slavery, Black people were counted as three-fifths. And so the M Missouri Compromise map was where Black people are concentrated in terms of slavery. The 1820 map, the footprint of Black people, uh, and then you look at the 1860 map, this is pre-Civil War. S slavery had expanded, the Black footprint is still in that same base area with expansion. And then the, uh, the 1950 map, uh, pre-1954, uh, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, which, which uh, outlawed um, Jim Crow segregation and, and, and made Plessy v. Ferguson no longer separate and equal. The pre-1950 map, 54 map, the same, same pattern. Uh, and, uh, and the 1964 uh, map, Civil Rights Act of 64. These maps uh, have been consistent, but it doesn't mean that we should not keep fighting because racism um, is baked into America's DNA. And we can go all the way back to, way back, 1619, America is segregated and so is pollution. We have to fight to change that baked in and we have to change that, those maps so that we do not allow future generations and future harm to follow that past, uh, uh, that past um, history. And I tell people, if Black people ha had not resisted uh, in, in the 60s and founded a civil rights movement 
we would still be picking cotton in Alabama. I grew up in South Alabama. I went to an all segregated um, um, uh, elementary, middle, and high school. So, so I understand how segregation can somehow create this pattern. We must break that pattern just like if we are an addict, at some point in time, we must get off of the racism and get on the democracy where your color of your skin or how much money you make will not matter. We have to be optimistic, otherwise we will resign ourselves to having those maps to continue into the future. Mm -hmm. 2042 is the magic year when this country will be majority people of color. That scares the hell out of a lot of people, but it doesn't scare me. The changing demographics, meaning that we have to go with the flow and look at those demographics and, and don't wait until 2042. We need to work on solutions to, so, to transition to a society that is egalitarian, where equal opportunity is for all, and that we do not allow those maps to control our destiny as a nation. When we decide that we're going to do that, we've never decided we're going to do that. Right. We allow those maps to control us and your zip code to be the most potent factor to determine health and well being. And if you look at the zip codes, it could be adjacent to each other, and you can find a, a, a life expectancy discrepancy of 15 years by living in that zip code. Now, we have to, your zip code can be more potent than your genetic code. So we have to change that, and we have to decide as a nation that we will not allow that to be our destiny. Now, that's what I've been fighting for for mm -hmm. all these decades, and I'm still mad. I'm glad you brought up civil rights because, um, you know, one of the first environmental justice cases I bought, uh, brought in Camden, New Jersey with Luke Cole, we won yes. first civil rights case to win in, uh, in federal court. Five days later, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned it. Um, and we're at a phase now where lots of the gains that, you know, previous generations fought for uh, the civil rights project, those laws and the Equal Protection Clause have been interpreted as not allowing us to cure past discrimination, but also to take into account race. And we're, we're awaiting a decision by the uh, Supreme Court on affirmative action. My question is, um, and we see it in some of the decisions of the Biden administration not to include race in environmental justice uh, or in uh, screening. Can you undo the effects of historical racial discrimination without taking into account race? Uh, short answer, no. Uh, so, but given the laws, how do you take account okay. race when it's illegal to do so? This is what we have to do. We have to acknowledge the fact what the, what the statistics say. Yeah. And when you do your very sophisticated statistical manipulations, your multiple regression, path analysis, all of that, when you run it in and run it out the computer, and then you ask your grandmother, and then you could show her the charts, and she said, baby, I could have told you that. But as I said before, having the facts is never enough. When you, even when you show and prove it, if there are, there's a court that says uh, we're not going to rule, you have to show that this was willful and on purpose. Mm -hmm. You can't use overwhelming statistical evidence. That was the Alexander Z. V. Sandoval. Right. Where you can't. You, mm -hmm. you, you have to show intent. How can you go into somebody's head because of people are not writing it down? I'm going to dump on uh, the native. Uh, uh, reservation. I'm on dump on. So, so, but we have to, we have to persist, and we have to uh, keep trying to develop tools and policies and elect individuals who can also pass laws so that the laws can get can be um, Supreme Court now uh, bulletproof. So, so that. So that you can't say, well, you Congress meant you to say this, and Congress say, well, this is what we meant, and this is what happened. So you get to make it bulletproof. But again, getting new laws is difficult. Mm -hmm. So that means we have to have executive orders. We have to go through administrative uh, types of things. It's great right now. There's a there's a um, a bill sitting in Congress. It's the uh, McEachin Environmental Justice for All Act that has all the things that we need in that act, but. It's not going anywhere because we have a, a split um, house and a, and, a, and a Senate. But again, we must still 
get our elected officials to push those bills, get it so that our American our public understand that this is what we need. Uh, I love the executive order, but not having a law that's bulletproof uh, against the Supreme Court, that's what we need. And as I said before, race has been, in some cases, neutered when we know that people who, if you go and look for a house that and your, your income is same as uh, somebody that's white and you're a person of color, your income, uh, your debt uh, to income ratio and all of that, you, you know that there's gonna be discrimination. If you live in a white neighborhood and you're black and you try to sell your house and your, real, your broker and your real estate agent is coming through, we always tell people, and we all know this being black and I've been black most of my life, uh, <laughs> is to take your pictures down. You can't have Kante Kente sitting in the room. You can't have a uh, Malcolm X or you can't even have President Obama sitting in your real house to identify this house as a black house because you're gonna get, and there's stories and there's anecdotal. When you take your, your, your blackness out of your house, your appraisal rates go up. And if you're getting $500, you may get another $250,000. So we have to somehow hide our race in order to get justice. That's not fair. That's not just, that's not equitable. But in reality, where well, we have a race uh, society that somehow penalizes, we call it a black tax, penalizes our community uh, for, for having this. This was in California, the progressive California. We're not in Mississippi or Alabama or Florida. That was in California. The lady took down all of her portraits and everything and stayed away and hired a new uh, real estate agent to show a house. She got, a, I think, like $250,000, $300,000 more, dollars more. So it's like, that's the price of race mm -hmm. and racism. But one of the things you're saying, and I want to give you credit, because you found a way to do this mapping yes. that will see what is obvious. That's your point, right? Yes. Yes. Without running into the Supreme Court, yes. right? Th yes. yes, this is what we did. Yeah. And we got money to do this from Bezos Earth Fund. That our project with, with Bezos in terms of Justice 40, the, the, the White House Council on Environmental Quality, when they did the screening tool, CEJSD, it's called a CJS tool. They, they left race out. The, the tool is supposed to design to find disadvantaged communities, and that's where the money is supposed to track. They left race out because they feared that they were going to get a lawsuit, and they probably would. But my, our position on AJ, on the uh, White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, those who, who are fierce about environmental justice, we said, sue them. Let them sue you. Don't, don't, but we lost that. And we say, okay, we're not mad. So, what our center did is that we went out and hired some, some, some African-American GIS data experts who have designed tools, and we design a parallel tool that can go side by side with the government tool. Our tool is based on real uh, uh, our GIS, and, and we could take the government tool, take that data and dump it into our tool that has race and pull up communities that are disadvantaged, that are not in the government tool, the, commu the communities that are disadvantaged, not by income, because we know there are black and brown neighborhoods, census tracts that, 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 don't, re that, that don't meet that income threshold. They have more money, but, but it's not poverty that's making them disadvantaged. It's the racism that denied them infrastructure uh, in terms of being flooded areas, the areas without pollution, areas that, that have not had the parks, green space, all those things. Those are disadvantaged communities. And we show this. African-American community, this is a University of uh, Colorado study that was done in uh, 2008 that, that looked at the whole country, found that African-American uh, uh, households that make 50 to $60,000 a year, this is middle income, pretty much, neighborhoods are more polluted than whites who make $10,000 a year. How can that be? Segregation, how is discrimination? A white person who lives in an apartment who has a small income, they can dress up and go and disappear into the whatever and, and not be discriminated against. But a black middle-class person dress up in a suit, go look for a house or mortgage, rent or, or, or own, met with discrimination. The Federal Reserve studies show that all, you know, in terms of the, the, the data, the Humda data, dealing with housing, mortgage. So, so our tool will ground truth and show those neighborhoods 
that are disadvantaged in terms of what I call infrastructure apartheid. And, and we can have our communities advocate for having our neighborhoods included and having the government tool to su be supplemented, showing that the money is designed for those communities too, because they suffer the same fate of low income working class communities that have been denied those infrastructures. Now that's what our tool is doing. Just like the CDC's Center for Disease Control tool that captures um, in a cumulative way health, uh, health outcomes. And it uses data and uses all kinds of show health. And the, uh, the uh, EPA's EJ screen also does that. And then the social vulnerability index also does that. We have trained communities across the country in these various tools that they can use and they can manipulate the data to make sure that there are no deserving communities that are left out of this Justice 40. Because if we just use the government tool, it will leave some of our communities out. And we said, you know, the, the New Deal uh, that was in the 30s left out Black people because redlining, they drew red lines around our neighborhood as being undesirable and risky. And they green line white communities that got the money. So our parents did not get uh, the, 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 the monies on, in the New Deal. So the Green New Deal, we have to make sure that we don't replicate the old New Deal by building in equity, justice, and fairness. Well, the that's right. Um, before I open it up, I wanna ask you about another dimension of justice right now. Uh, so right now we're undergoing an energy transition and a lot of the IRA is designed to catalyze and accelerate that. Um, and that means to renewables, to solar, to wind, et cetera. But we also know that the same communities that are the subject of those on your screen have the highest energy burden are unlikely to reap the benefits for that. So, so, this, so these terms that we now hear, energy justice, energy democracy, tell me um, where you see um, what is happening now with the money coming through uh, from the IRA and Justice 40, et cetera, how energy justice um, is going to be attended to, how these communities can participate fully in this and not be another study in 10 years about how they're not reaping the benefits of the transition. Yes, yes. Energy justice is a big issue. It's more than energy insecurity in, turn your, in terms of your house, uh, your, your electric bill being uh, so high that you are energy insecure. And it's usually the communities, the residents, the households that are, in, that are energy insecure, they also food insecure and they also housing insecure in terms of paying more for their uh, rent or, or, or housing than the, the norm. And so what we have been working on is environmental climate and energy justice in rolling it all in the same thing. And, and pretty much in the Southern part of the country where we have lots of, um, of um, uh, potential for wind and solar, we're getting more and more people of color into the business mm -hmm. and, not, and segmenting uh, jobs in terms of worker training, like uh, Deep South Center, and our center has operated a green jobs program since 1995 from NIEHS, National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences. We're transitioning that program to deal with some of the green energy, green jobs. Um, we started that program when I was at Clark Atlanta, you know, and again, when, once again, uh, uh, Clark Atlanta and, and Xavier University partnership with this training program. We have, we have now in, uh, making sure that when resources flow to those areas, that our community-based organizations, because a lot of the, the Inflation Reduction Act monies can go to nonprofits. And the nonprofits themselves must have the capacity to handle this amount of money that's getting ready to flow that way. So it means that we have to build capacity. We have to make sure that they can handle those dollars, do the training that, that's, that's necessary. And we talk about uh, uh, community-based organization networks, like in Houston, our center, has a partnership with six uh, uh, community-based organizations representing six neighborhoods in Houston. We've had those partnerships for, for more than a decade. And so they, we have them ready now to start applying for different funding. When I dealt with uh, that study in 1979, one of the landfills that was part of the study was in Southeast Houston 
in Sunnyside neighborhood, the Holmes Road landfill. It wasn't a landfill, it was a dump. That dump now, that landfill now uh, has been converted and will be one of the largest solar farms in the country. And it's, and again, so you're taking a bad situation in a predominantly black neighborhood that has had dumps all over the place. And now they're taking that land and they're using the land to, to build out just energy and an energy, energy just um, solution to a problem that had been plaguing that community in terms of transmissions, in terms of who would benefit, the community itself in terms of the, the, in terms of the grid. We are working right now to proposing uh, with our university and a public housing uh, development next door and, and the houses in that neighborhood to create a microgrid uh, that, would, that would service not only our university, but also a partnership with this public housing development and some of the houses that are in this neighborhood in our third ward. There's a project like that in, in uh, Chicago, in the Bronzeville neighborhood with partnership with National Argonne Lab. Our university has a, a, a MOU, Memorandum of Understanding with DOE, with uh, Brookhaven Lab in New York. These are projects that are coming online. In, in, in New Orleans, for example, there's an old Ag, Ag Street landfill that was a Superfund site that EPA cleaned up. It's laying dormant. And, and the Superfund site was created after Hurricane Betsy in 1965, and they took all the, the rubble and, and poison and dumped it in that neighborhood, and they built houses on top of it, black middle class. The neighborhood has been, been moved out, but that, that landfill site is still there. They're talking about solar farm in that area. So when we talk about solutions, we need shovel-ready projects. Our program, our initiative is to help communities um, when they envision a project. We don't tell them what project, they, they come up with their own priorities with project green in our community, green in our schools. Our schools in our neighborhoods are, are in poor infrastructure condition. We're talking about greening the school buses, oh, dirty diesel buses, we're talking about even making those buses electric, making the schools green schools in terms of platinum lead certified, no gold, platinum. That's what we're talking about. So pro real projects, green in our community in terms of urban heat items, more trees, more green space, more parks, more walk trails, all of that. And energy is connected to all of that. Green energy, clean energy, and job. Not, and, and if we look at what the, the, the jobs in clean energy, it's only 8% that's black. And, and we got, we like 12, 13%. So it, they, they need to do better. And we say clean energy, you need to be just. Just like we're gonna go after you if you're not just fair and equitable when it comes to employment and when it comes to business, entrepreneur. That's what we talk, that's $27 billion. Mm -hmm in the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, $27 billion. That means greening up, green banks. You know, banks have, have redlined our communities. It was minority-owned banks, banks of color that lent to homeowners. We talk about a green fund, green banks that can do the same thing in our community to fund those green projects when it comes to green, uh, uh, green infrastructure. We now have experts in a lot of fields. And what we have to do is bring those experts together in a collective to come up with innovative, creative projects that have been prioritized by communities and let the community drive it. And we work together in partnership. Community university partnerships, that's the way we go. And we have to think, we have to tell the community, think big. Don't just think about this little grocery store here. Think big. Think about redevelopment, re-envisioning your community. And what I love about this is that the university is a platform to bring these folks together, right? Yes. And I think that that is really, and a lot of this money coming down through the IRA is for intermediaries like universities to help communities, right? Uh, yeah. And other trusted. actors come together. Let trusted. me just say this yeah. now. Trusted. All universities are not created equal. I'm talking about trusted universities yeah. Yeah. that have partnerships, not fly in, parachute in, yeah. and create partnerships on paper. That's the worst thing that could happen. Trusted partnerships with proven track records and you say, and the community says, show me your receipts. Mm -hmm. What have you done for us lately? That's right, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so let me open it up to the audience. And are we gonna ask people to come to the microphones? Great. Students first.
Y'all hear me? Okay, well, you can just project. Yes, good. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Good. Hey, family. My name is Ethan Rodriguez. I'm a first year master's student for uh, public policy here um, to make data science. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about the clean energy revolution and all that kind of stuff and thinking about really the raw materials it's going to take to implement uh, clean energy in America. I know those raw materials are going to come from Africa. They're going to come from South America. So how do we how do we uh, square those things? And when we're talking about justice, how do we make sure that justice is distributed to our cousins, our brothers, our sisters in Africa and South America too, not just here in America? Yeah, very good question. That's what the COP meeting was about. That's about harmonizing. You can't talk about justice in the U.S. without talking about justice abroad. And that's a that's a important part in terms of having having extractive industries. Uh, that uh, where you need the raw materials in a way that you have to talk about what happens in those host countries that's that's doing the doing the extraction and and not just allowing those countries to lag behind. That's that uh, development fund, climate development fund that talk about uh, economic development and talk about uh, funds to to deal with a disaster, but also economic development so that those so that the so that the technology transfer uh, happens across the board. And, and again, it's, uh, it's where those countries have to be in those rooms to negotiate uh, what they want. And, and they can't just uh, have top level negotiators and the folks where, where this uh, precious metals and all the other extractive um, 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 raw materials are coming are outside the room. That's the climate, justice, economic justice, racial justice, um, uh, energy justice, where, where it can, economic justice, where it converges. It's one movement. And those of, of us who work on these issues uh, in the US, we, we are very aware of that because the same issues that we were, we were fighting in the 90s in terms of the waste trade, uh, in terms of other things, um, uh, having waste coming from the US going to uh, Mexico or the Caribbean or to Africa, the West Africa, uh, same kind of thing. Or the exploited oil, oil and gas uh, industry in, mm -hmm. in Nigeria, you know, and what's happening with, and, you know, I, I was around when Ken, uh, Ken Sarah Weevil and, and six other uh, brothers in Nigeria mm -hmm. were hanged and the companies and the government polluted to allow that to happen. We must not allow that kind of exploitation to, to go forward in, in, in terms of this um, transition. Very good. Nick? Hello, Dr. Bullard. Uh, I'm Daniel. I'm a student in the uh, Georgetown MSCSM program. Uh, acknowledging the importance of environmental justice in the realm of government and policy, what do you believe should be the role for uh, private corporations and companies? Well, I think corporations have responsibility, and those who are who 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 believe in sustainability and who believe in a just uh, world uh, should step up and step out and speak out. Uh, the corporate voices, uh, and some of them have, uh, I do think that uh, the, they are very important to the economy. And as we uh, talk about a, an economy that, that is fair, uh, just, and sustainable, I think the, the business community uh, elected officials, uh, uh, universities, um, uh, NGOs, nonprofits, community-based organizations, there are roles that need to be pay played. And that I think is important that we democratize the decision-making in terms of how we move forward uh, in, in that economic realm and not close, uh, closed doors and behind closed doors or in, in rooms that are just... Um, deal with just elites and, and those who can muscle their way with their money to make decisions. Uh, some of that is changing, and, and I think we have to accelerate that and, the, the, and change what we produce 
And as consumers, we have a lot of power that's, that's not utilized in terms of what we buy. And, and, and we, have, we, don't, we, we don't have a, a, a large uh, movement in terms of, uh, of resisting buying certain products. I won't say the B word, uh, but I could say boycott, but I won't. Uh, I, we, could, we have not used our purchasing power to the extent that we have that power to influence, uh, to dictate. And I think as we become more and more uh, informed about what, what is being done to communities and to our planet, I think it may get us in a better light of, of saying resisting um, uh, the, the kinds of products that are put out there and we saying no to that. And I think younger people are more inclined, more so to do the B word than, than my generation, which is good. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Bullard of the CISPEC. Um, my name is Amanda. It's a pleasure to hear you speak. I'm actually going to be starting work for the White House Environmental Justice Council in a few weeks. So hopefully Excellent. this is the last time. Well, um, my question is more technical. Is the tool that you were referencing before that you helped develop live already? And what is it called? And how can we access that? Oh, okay, our tool is called HCGES, HBCU Climate Environmental Justice Screening Tool. It's the same initial, but with H in front of it. But the initials are different. The government tool is Climate Economic Justice Screening Tool. See, the government tool took out um, environment, yes, you know, you know, you'd say you plan with words and our tool put it back in. It put environment back in and it put race in. Okay. So our tool is designed for our community partners that are part of our HBCU consortium and our hub organizations. So it's not a, a tool that's out there that you can access whatever. We designed it for the, simp for the simple purpose of doing this and aggressively going uh, for this. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not available to the public, it's internal. Yes, it's internal. It's an internal tool to be used by our community partners and we expand those community partners. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Sure. Um, hi, Dr. Bullard. My name is Clayton Picorni. I'm in the same um, environment sustainability management program. It's a pleasure to talk to you. I kind of had a question in the similar vein as the first one when we think about uh, globalized um, corporations and how climate change will um, affect us disproportionately dis or communities disproportionately on a global scale. Yeah. So thinking about uh, kind of a global environmental justice movement, what are really the trends you've seen in the last decades? Are there any spark plug moments um, in your opinion that have really affected the growth of kind of a global environmental justice or climate justice movement? And what are the, maybe the key takeaways from your own experience doing this work in the United States that could be applied to a larger yeah. Well, well, thanks. Thanks for you. Clayton. Yes. Thanks for that question. Uh, uh, the COP6 meeting was in The Hague, 2000, and we didn't have credentials to get on the blue zone. A few of us did, the government zone. So we organized the first climate justice summit, NGO summit, and we, this is 2000 now, in, in the Netherlands, in The Hague. And uh, we planned it for 500 people, 500, and 1,000 folks showed up. We gave the spark. That was the first climate justice summit. And that's when climate justice was starting to get integrated inside of the UN uh, COP um, uh, activities. Uh, and over the different COPs meetings, uh, a lot of the, now in, oh, let me just give you uh, honest now. At that COP meeting in 2000, uh, a lot of the NGOs, the green groups uh, did not participate in our meeting. Because well, this was the EJ meeting and climate justice was, was new to some of the groups and some of the groups did not embrace environmental justice. If you understand what I'm saying, environment, the climate justice came out of mm. environmental justice. So the same groups that resisted us uh, resisted our conference. So no, no, I'm just giving history. We're friends now, we're, we're family now, but we, but we got memories. <laughs> we don't hold against them, but we just whip out our memory bank. 
<laughs> and say, I remember when you're trying to lead this. I so, so what I have seen over the different cop meetings, more and more embracing, particularly in the green zone, in terms of the NGO um, global forum part. And we have been able to start making headways with our green group allies to talk about building a global movement around climate justice and environmental justice. And, and not just using climate change as a vehicle to transition to this global stage where climate change was more parts per million and greenhouse gases. And in the US, they were trying to pass a climate, climate bill into a law that left us out, that left out the justice part, left our vulnerability, didn't go anywhere. It fizzled like a, like a, a fizzle. So what I have seen is when, when some of the green groups started to embrace our paradigm and our, and our framing, we started to grow our movement in the US and grow it abroad in terms of climate justice is not an outlier. It is essential to getting global climate change policy on a global sense, international sense, that's synchronized with what happened on the ground, especially in, in countries that are experiencing um, the calamity right now and have contributed at least to the problem. So, so as I said, for 26 cops, uh, small island states and countries that are experiencing big climate uh, calamities, we got nowhere. And, but, but it was building, it was building, building. And the, the, the meeting in Paris was, a, was an essential, was a watershed moment. Like our HBCU consortium, we took 50 black students from 15 HBCUs to Paris, to climate. They never seen that many black kids in a one space. We planned it, we raised the money, we took, and we said, we bringing our young people to Paris so they understand and connect with other young people around the world to advance this climate justice. That was in Paris. And then each one, additional one, we were able to get our messaging right to align with the young man was talking about these, these, um, these minerals that's gonna power this clean energy. We have to get it right so that we don't just extract and exploit. Hmm. The, this last meeting in Egypt on the continent of Africa was a culmination, I think, in all of that work, those previous cops, where we were not, where we had a pavilion, but we had done the homework in lining up our allies in our countries, um, low moderate income countries, developing world. They say third world. What, what, in other words, those, those countries that have contributed at least but are experiencing climate change. We were all with one voice, whether in Brazil, in Ecuador, uh, in, in in the Caribbean, Pacific, South America, I mean, Asia, so we were aligned. And we came to Egypt with powerful voices and we were able to convince our own government that went to uh, Egypt, the COP27, with the position of, no, we can't agree to loss and damage. Like in the previous COP, when we were in Scotland, they said, oh no, we can't do that. We can't do that. Well, well, you're 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 against us, our EJ movement here, and we are with the with the global South on this. A change in Egypt, when the when the the, the governments um, that contributed most of the problem decided that loss and damage was legitimate, and how it got interpreted, and the idea of rep repairing the damage for the countries that have contributed least to the problem. That's repairing the damage. And they don't like reparation, but I, you know, it's loss and damage. And the loss of cultural, loss of your whole society through climate change, your country's going down. Uh, so, so yes, so the trend now is like this. So in Dubai, COP28, we're ready because the devil is in the detail. Mm. You said you were gonna do this? Damn it, we got folks listening, we got tapes. We got video, all that stuff. We didn't sleep. We didn't make it up. So we're to hold them, hold them accountable, hold them to their word, and to follow through. And the U.S. government has to follow through. You know, the administration has already started to uh, 
however many millions of dollars, whatever. And of course, it's fighting against the tide or this conservative don't want to be global. Uh, you doing this, we don't want to give money. I mean, the fact that generations have benefited from pumping this stuff into the air that we've contributed to it so globally. So we have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's the trend. And I see the trend continuing on the trend toward justice and global and more awareness that we have to, we have to live in a world where we, where we have resources, we have to share. We just can't keep the, it's like the COVID, like the, the, the vaccine, we just can't keep it to ourselves because if we keep it to ourselves, that's not gonna be in the best interest of this global community. Thank you so much and good luck. Yes. No, good luck. <laughs> good luck. Your generation. That's good right. luck. Pass the baton. That's right. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, I'd like to make a comment and plug a resource and also ask a question. So this morning, um, a group of students, faculty, alumni, and affiliates of Georgetown called Kavea uh, had the opportunity to have brunch with Dr. Robert Bullard. And Kaveh is an organization that, um, well, a community that I founded with a friend as Georgetown alumnus and also now staff for members of the global majority to talk about and be in community about ecological justice. And it was founded because I realized that these issues of black, brown, indigenous people of color who are the most affected by environmental issues aren't represented in our classrooms, in our literature, in our media, in our conversations. Um, and also the face of environmentalism and the voice of environmentalism at Georgetown is very white. So we founded this group called Kaveya, which was initially an eco literature circle, but is now an affinity group. So if there's anybody here in this room, if you know anyone that's a member of the global majority, so that's black, brown, indigenous, has heritage in the global south, reach out. My net ID is AK1731. We're a great community. We are very intergenerational um, and have folks that are older and younger and all over the place. So that's a resource. Um, and my question is, so this morning when we were at brunch with Dr. Bullard, it was an incredible opportunity for knowledge transaction. Like we, there was so much reciprocity. He was telling us stories. We were telling him stories and it was a one form of knowledge acquisition. So with everything that you told us about academia and about the urgency, how do you reconcile those two, given that academia, getting masters and PhDs takes time, takes money, takes energy, yeah. and also, but it's also apparently the only way that anybody will take us seriously. But we don't have the time. So how do you reconcile those two? Yes. I wish I had a, a one to give more time, but we have to multitask. <laughs> we have to get our PhDs, and we, if we are really passionate about the justice part and the community part, I think you can do both. But it means you have to be laser focused. You can't be, I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to stay in, you know, this box and, uh, and isolate yourself. But you have to be laser focused and, and operate with that urgency of getting that PhD, getting, a, getting that certificate, a degree that gives you those credentials, and at the same time, stay in touch with the communities. And you can give a lot as a student. Resource, students are excellent resources, and they come at a reasonable price. <laughs> um, so 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 yes so so yes uh, uh it's urgent we need more young people with those credentials so that they can't just blow you off and like oh what do you know but and even they will still blow you off and the ageism is still just rampant yes get those degrees get that experience stay engaged and understand that you do not have 40 years to do this okay. we don't have 40 years because of this climate that's the urgency. Universities, all of them are, are relatively conservative. It means that students have to, in some cases, um, lead. And, and if you have good professors, and I know you do here at Georgetown, that, and you, you don't need everybody. If you're waiting for everybody, you will be still waiting. Have a good critical mass of, of students and professors, administration that can support, and you can, we can shorten that that, that distance to uh, shorten that arc to justice. Now that's, I do, I really believe that. And I've seen it work mm. in action as we get more generational. As I said before, I have students who have students who are doing this work now. And every now and then I'm a, I'm a teacher at heart. Every now and then 
I get a student, a former student, will come back and say, Dr. Bullard, I'm an environmental toxicologist. Dr. Bullard, I'm a lawyer. I said, you a lawyer? You were asleep in my class. <laughs> so you never, you, you never know who's listening. You know what I'm saying? Now that's a reward for a teacher to get somebody, a student, a former student come back and say, oh, I'm doing, no, I'm doing this. That's what we do it for. So that we get those rewards and, and that, and that uh, intangible uh, money. It's better than money when you say you are doing this and, and, and you heard what I was trying to say. Uh, and, 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 uh, and you've done what you set out to do. Now that's very rewarding. So we have to get on the case as urgency, uh, with the urgency of now, period. Okay. Nothing else is short of that. Is that. Do you hear what I'm saying? I hear it. All right. All right. Let All right. me, um, <laughs> we're going to wrap it real quick. We have a couple minutes left. I want both of you to ask your question and then I'm going to give him the last word. Perfect. Okay. Thank Go you ahead. so much. Um, hi, Dr. Bullard. My hey. name is Kelsey. I'm a part of the Environmental and Sustainability Management program as well. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and ask, you mentioned the importance of standing with communities as the energy transition takes place. Have you participated or have been a part of any community discussions around community benefit agreements? Mm -hmm. um, our group is currently, our capstone group is currently um, taking on along with partnering with the Department of Energy to kind of um, tackle all those or get a couple of, you know, CBAs that are going on right now within the United States and it's been difficult. So I just wanna, you know, um, hear about your side on that. Okay, well, uh, yes, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Dion, I'm from the Global Human Development Program. Um, back home in the Philippines, I'm an env environmental lawyer. Um, and I think environmental justice is shaping very strong in the Philippines, but a lot of the challenges we experience um, particularly as lawyers um, filing cases to make. And I believe also environmental justice also talks about accountability of the government and the private actors. And a lot of the challenges that we experience, for example, the first case we filed in the Supreme Court, on the basis of precautionary principle, the Supreme Court asked for evidence. And I think um, all the tools that your center has created are potentially used to make or as a tool for accountability. And I'm interested to know if, um, how do you see all these tools being used for accountability as accountability mechanism? Um, and has there been any cases where your tools has been used for um, environmental litigation? Great. Yeah, thank you. Let me ask the, uh, the, the, um, the last question first. In terms of the tools that we develop, are tools to be utilized uh, in support of communities and, and in addition to getting them a uh, knowledge as to uh, how to collect data, use data, and get the science and the facts so that they're speaking for themselves. Uh, these are not the only tools that we bring to bear uh, in terms of the tools. Lawyers are tools uh, and, and other kinds of, of uh, technical support are tools that we can draw upon uh, with expertise. And so we have to bring everything to bear for on issues. And there is no cookie cutter. There's no one size that fits all. And I think the, the getting communities um, looking, at, uh, looking at expanding their base and bringing in more young people uh, to, to work on these issues, because a lot of our organizations are top heavy with older people. And I'm, I'm not an ageism because I'm 76 years old and I believe in, in, uh, in still uh, uh, working with communities, but there's some things we just need more young people with energy to do and go to and using the best technology, social media, whatever, to, to get the communication out. So yes, I think in the Philippines, uh, or whether it's in other uh, countries that have problems with government, democracy and whatever, how lawyers are being used, I think lawyers need support. Uh, on a lot of these um, cases and et cetera, in terms of data, studies, science, blah, blah, blah. So we have to identify those and share those resources. Now on the um, example with uh, community benefits agreement, we worked out, we're working with DOE right now uh, to make sure that they understand what some of their uh, great projects and some of their not so great projects uh, are in terms of, of deploying uh, technology uh, and and uh, ensuring that we don't deploy 
new technology that would exacerbate old problems in terms of pollution on top of pollution, et cetera. And the community benefits agreement that's being worked out in terms of solar farms and other uh, deployment of, of green infrastructure, uh, the community themselves must drive that. I'm in a planning program. There are community plans. We can, our, our, our center in our, my department, urban planning and environment policy can assist communities in developing community driven plans. And so you use students to help develop plans and the community plans can be just as uh, professional looking and just as solid as a plan that was done by a consultant uh, with big books. Mm -hmm. And so when the communities take the plan in, whether it's a solar farm or, or micro -grid, grid, or whether it's for greening up the school, meeting with school board members and, and, honest, and explaining to them how we green the schools, you increase the test scores. All the studies show when you make the schools much more pleasing and, and, and a good environment for learning, the scores go up. So the school boards be aware that this is an environmental justice issue. The school board members who never heard of environmental justice, what are you talking about? We talk about greening in schools, bringing in all kinds of new innovative um, green materials and, and, and rooftop solar and, and, and community garden, et cetera. That's how we have to educate our elected officials on all of the, the kinds of new resources that are available. Whereas five years ago, they, they would, they would this would be on that wish list. So let's take it off the wish list and the to-do list. That's what we're talking about, to-do. And, and the other list is we're getting it done through these community benefits agreements. That's what we have to do. And that's part of DOE has, is written into their programmatic funding, community benefits agreement. So it's not something that communities have to make up. And so we have to make sure that communities know what to ask for. Because so some, some communities have been denied so much, they, they may ask for one little thing. We said, no, you can ask for much more. Mm -hmm. Think about how many decades you've been living with this. So let's talk about something else. This Superfund site is cleaned up in this uh, uh, city property. Let's turn it, press the city to turn that land over to the community organization, nonprofit for a dollar. And the community can develop a vision as to how that's gonna be redeveloped on the brownfields with millions of dollars or whatever. The community has to, be informed of all the possibilities that's there in terms of program programmatic, and they can inform themselves in terms of their vision, and you try to match those up. That's what we're doing right now in real time, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but we have to get more people doing it so that we don't miss any communities and communities that are left out because they don't have the expertise and the resources and the partners to get those very difficult uh, grant proposals going into the government. It's like, they're not streamlined. It's like proposals from hell in terms of the application. It's just, oh, and we said, damn, y'all need to streamline this. And we trying, we trying. But there's a, there's a, um, um, there's a, uh, um, let's see, how much is it? $570 million a program from EPA right now that, that's, uh, it, it, that's creating, uh, going to create 10 grant makers. And each one are going to get a, um, I think it's 50 million, 50 million dollars, I think, each one. And the, and the money's gonna be sent out through streamlined proposals. It won't be the government proposal, it'll be streamlined. And meaning that, that if you become one of the grant makers, uh, then you're, you're, you can uh, give grants to organizations that ordinarily would not be able to fill out those long proposals, but they have to have the infrastructure the, the accounting system, et cetera, but would not have to jump through all those government uh, application hoops. Now that's a big program right now and, and uh, the application is due in May, in the May. And there's a lot of, a lot of uh, people vying for that, but you must have had the experience in order to get that of being a grant maker. All of our grants that we have, working with communities, we have a pass-through. Pass-through is nothing more than you have, you have did a sub-award. Mm -hmm. That's the qualification. So, so the long and short is in those community benefits agreement that's made with the community and other organizations, you get it written up on paper. It's a contract that's enforceable and not this good neighbor agreement. No, it's, this is a community benefits agreement is, is different than good neighbor. Good neighbor is just like, oh, we're friends. No. Business. We need lawyers business. to enforce it. It's business, right? It's business. Yeah. B -I -Z. <laughs> this is about the B-I-Z. This is about business. So business. you like lawyers. 
Huh? So you like lawyers? I like lawyers. <laughs> On tap. Let's, <laughs> um, let's thank uh, Dr. Bob Bullard, who is, uh, thank you sincerely for your inspiration, for your research, for your expertise, for your advocacy, for your authenticity. You. Um, you are a legend, and I'm so glad that you're uh, showing more generations how to work for environmental climate and energy justice. So thank you very much for coming to Georgetown. Thank you. <laughs> it's always this way it's always this way yeah